All right, next up is Blake Osborne from the University of Colorado. Thank you very much, Chase and Maria. Um, I am Blake Osborne, and I am from the arch rival of the University of Colorado, Colorado State University. Um, and I'm going to talk today about a watershed planning project that I applied systems thinking to and, and how we're trying to improve water quality in a rural watershed in Colorado. So I'd like to start by just maybe testing a mental model that you have already. Um, and if it helps, you can keep your eyes open or close your eyes if you'd like to, but um, actually scratch that as the last presenter. Let's do it with our eyes open. Um, what is the first thing that comes to mind, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when I mention Colorado? Mountains. mountains. Yes, I figured that would be a popular one. Uh, it's, you know, mountains and, and skiing is a, is a common one. Some people think of the Colorado River. Um, but I would venture a guess that not many people, not just in this room, but in general, uh, think of the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. But in fact, parts of Colorado were in the epicenter of the Dust Bowl. <clears throat> and I know our charismatic mountains get a lot of attention, um, but nearly half of Colorado and most of the eastern plains are actually considered a semi-desert. And that's not something that comes to people's minds uh, you know, often or quickly. But really, what does the Dust Bowl of the 1930s have to do with our current water challenges in Colorado? Uh, especially water quality. You know, what is, the, what is the link there? Well, the Dust Bowl is a catastrophic example of the intersection between worsening environmental conditions and improper management decisions. So, you know, drought and un uh, unsustainable farming contributed to some of the worst Dust Bowl conditions. And it's easy to look back almost a century later and critique farmers and, and land managers, but we can't forget that farming is practiced really on all of our behalf. And the Dust Bowl taught us a really good lesson in Colorado. It gave us a good model for understanding how you can work from an agency's perspective, then it was the Soil Conservation Service, to try to make improvements with private landowners to improve the public good. And in that case, it was, it was a soil erosion. But if you fast forward, to, to today, uh, the same exact part of Colorado that experienced the worst Dust Bowl conditions is now experiencing a new but less catastrophic issue, uh, and this time it's with water quality. So stream segments within a rural watershed of southeastern Colorado, and they're represented by the red lines, are the impaired water bodies. Um, they're impaired by naturally occurring elements, and Jay kind of touched on this in, in his system, but we have something similar. There are shallow bedrock formations that contain selenium, uranium, sulfates, uh, and a variety of salts. So, you know, how do you get farmer, or, whoops. So herein lies our wicked problem for our watershed. How do you get farmers and ranchers or private landowners, about 80 to 85% of this watershed is private. And that's challenging in Colorado. A lot of the watershed planning is done in the mountains where you have maybe one landowner, like uh, the Forest Service or the federal government to work with. But in our watershed, it's, it's about 85% private. So how do you get private landowners, which are the largest water users in this watershed, to voluntarily implement best management practices around agriculture that will alleviate some of these naturally occurring pollutants and ultimately improve water quality? And this, um, this isn't something that's terribly new. I know this is done a lot in the Midwest, especially around nutrients, you know, trying to work with producers to improve water quality through this kind of this linear model. But where it's a little bit different in Colorado is we are a headwater state. And so all of our major rivers have compacts, uh, su most often Supreme Court mediated legal documents where we have to deliver water to our neighbors. So this red box represents our Arkansas River Compact. And so it's very challenging in the Arkansas River Basin to change anything with hydrology, including some of these very important best management practices that can actually make improvements in water quality. It's very challenging and very expensive for private landowners to do that. So how do we go through this framework and this, this model given our constraints? So that was the starting point. Uh, so I decided I, I, I'm working currently with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the Colorado Department of Agriculture and myself uh, we saw an opportunity to use systems thinking, and this, in particular, this Think Water uh, opportunity, 
to develop our Arkansas River watershed plan. And it didn't start out easy, and this is really washed out, but that's not, but the point is still there that this was my very first conceptual diagram. And I had a really big challenge, and this has been touched on by other fellows in, in the, the Wisconsin Water School participants, of setting boundary conditions. You know, I wasn't sure where to lump and where to split. So what I ended up with was a very, you know, fractured, kind of parted out diagram with a, a web of perspectives and relationships. Um, and it was a little overwhelming at first. But eventually this, this whole thing boiled down to what I, I'm calling the bow tie diagram. And this is a simplified version of that, but at the center of this whole watershed planning effort are these agricultural best management practices. And we first realized that we needed to identify these BMPs that will actually work for our system, a dry land, very arid system. Um, okay, and then how are we going to actually develop projects to integrate these BMPs? And finally, how do we evaluate those projects inside our constraints or our framework, which is the Arkansas River Compact? So the project itself split out into two phases. We have the development of the watershed plan, and then we have the future phase, which we'll get to next year, uh, which is phase two, which is implementation and a, and a constant evaluation of this watershed plan. And we define the relationships and some of the, the systems and the parts, but mostly the relationships as either regulatory, non-regulatory, or kind of a mix of regulatory and non-regulatory uh, relationships. And then our, our stakeholder group broke down into the general watershed group, uh, farmers and ranchers, and state and federal agencies. Um, the watershed group included farmers and ranchers and some folks from the federal agencies, but it also included kind of small landowners or just general uh, interested citizens, non, uh, yeah, nonprofits or NGOs as well. So just focusing on, on, on phase one of the watershed plan, so this is where we're at. If you look first at the first step, critical to develop your stakeholder network. So this mapping was very helpful in first what we did was we identified attributes that we needed to obtain from our stakeholder group. Things like, you know, who's going to help us identify the causes and sources of pollution? Who's going to help us identify data? You know, who do we need at the table? Who's going to help us with the uh, financial assistance and how do we persuade them to come to our meetings? Um, and then finally, we needed to continue that education and outreach, but also look for other people who could fill in our knowledge gaps. So those were some of the criteria that we looked in our, for, for in our stakeholders. And then, then once, it, once we got some people to the meeting, brought them to the table, it really broke down into there's kind of the landowning stakeholders and the non-landowning stakeholders. And the, most of the landowning stakeholders are the farmers and ranchers. And a little bit of land is owned by the, the, the federal government and even a smaller part by the state government. And those are the ones that we have saw as kind of critical stakeholders that can actually take these, these BMPs and implement them not just regulate them, but actually implement them to make actual meaningful uh, water quality improvements. And then we had our non-landowner non stakeholders um, that provided really valuable input. But once we identified our, our stakeholders that could actually take this and implement it, we started looking at projects and project development. And again, we, we added a filter. So you know, if we thought of a project, okay, well, where are we gonna get the funding for this project? How are we gonna design a project schedule? Who's gonna be in charge? Um, and then finally, how are we going to measure success? And this is all relating back to these agricultural best management practices. Now, phase two will be next year, and that's the actual implementation and evaluation of the watershed plan. And through this mapping exercise, it really, it, it was really interesting to do because, you know, I had, I had thought of this as an iterative process, but really drawing it out and seeing where those iterations take place was very helpful. So, you know, obviously to get a project going, you need the money and you need the technical support. Then you can implement the project and then you need to constantly be monitoring, looking at data, you know, um, going back and identifying what's successful and continue that dialogue with your stakeholder group. So it's kind of bouncing back and forth between implementation and evaluation. Uh, but that's, that's our model that we're going to take forward uh, next year. So in summary, um, you know, for me, systems thinking was just a really good way to test my own mental models. Uh, it's really a lens that I used, and, and it was a tool that helped me create flexibility. Um, you know, I, th I think that so far in, in this process, where I work with a lot of stakeholders, uh, are really, uh, you know, you need a strong foundation, but there is a lot of flexibility that's needed. And, and I realized that a, a more flexible watershed plan and a, and a planning process was going to be a stronger plan. So. Um, yeah, I, before I 
can't forget to thank, I appreciate the Cabreras and their group and Jeremy um, for this opportunity. And yeah, that's all I have.